Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Don Haina, and uh, this is the MIT swim <laughs> financial swim test training presentation. And uh, I wanted to give a little background. So when I was an undergrad at MIT, um, you couldn't graduate unless you actually passed the swim test, which I think was treading water for about ten minutes. And uh, and I, I love this photo, which which came up on the the MIT press uh, actually. Because I remember thinking I had had lifeguard training and how hard could this test be? And it turns out when I got there, you weren't allowed to float. And I think you actually couldn't use your hands or so. There was some trick to it. And I remember, oh, this was a little harder than I thought. So um, I mentioned that because I think investing can be a little harder than we thought, even though it's all simple equations and things like that. And so uh, just like MIT had a prep class for the night before the exam and you kind of got to review everything, you um, maybe thought you knew or knew you didn't know. Uh, I'm gonna to try to go through a lot of material really quick and some of it you'll know and some of it you won't and hopefully it ties it all together a bit. So um, with that, I will start with a couple of slides. An introduction. So I was an electrical engineer, undergrad. I stayed and got my master's in EECS. I, I did the program called 6A. I worked at a bunch of high-tech companies. I went to Stanford Business School actually thought there'd be more technical stuff at the business school. And um, when I left, I kind of had a hankering for that. So I, I did some classes in the statistics department and um, around quantitative finance. I, I became a chartered financial analyst, alternative investment analyst, financial data stuff, and, um, and an investment advisor. And, um, and I, but I'm not selling anything on this call. My promise is this is to help you make good decisions, particularly if you've been timid or uncertain about investing and uh, how to invest wisely and manage some, manage your investments and avoid some pitfalls. Um, let's see. And uh, one other thing I want to mention for the people that are joining, let's see where, yeah, we're getting more people. If you could just put a text in um, to say what state you're, come, you're, you're sort of attending from, That'll help me understand how, how far this uh, message is getting out. And also I can talk a little bit about taxes and things like that. Now, um, so I'm a fiduciary, which means I have clients best interests in mind. There's nothing to sell, um, which is different if you work with some advisors that sell financial products and that's something you should know. And uh, starting from near zero knowledge of investments, we're gonna take a serious survey of the things you need to know, where to look up things, some practical lingo, and uh, how to speak with confidence when you talk to other professional uh, advisors and things like this. So today I'm gonna to go in really quick bursts, uh, maybe five or 10 minutes with a bunch of slides. At the end, we'll have some clarifications and questions. I'm not gonna talk about uh, anyone's particular financial situation. It's a deeply personal subject. And it's actually, it's interesting, you know, it's finance is one of the things we often don't even talk to uh, talk about with our friends. So uh, we'll stay away from personal history and anecdotes and just keep it to the subject material. Um, one thing I should say, it's not investment advice. One of the problems that you have in, in, a, in a forum like this is, I'd love to tell you what stocks and how to invest and all these things, but there's this uh, nagging thing called suitability. And suitability means I need to know your, situ your situation and all sorts of other things about your financial goals before I can make an appropriate recommendation. So this is more attending a lecture where somebody doesn't know anything about your situation, but can give you general strategies and rules that are going to really help you out. Now, um, all the math you'll need for this talk is it's basic stuff. I'm sure if you went to MIT, it's not going to be intimidating. Um, and we'll go through it. It's mostly, I suggest you look and try to get the intuition of the subject material and don't try to take notes so much. Now, jumping right in, I wanted to talk about a situation uh, with some MIT students and the passage of time. And so in this example, you can just kind of scan across here. Uh, we had four students, Ali, Bo, Chandra, and Devin, who built a spaceship. Sure. They didn't realize they were gonna circle the black hole for a while. They came back to earth, suddenly 20 years had passed. Now, what's interesting about this situation, the passage of time is that they each did something a little bit different with their net worth, which was actually negative given the loans they had. So you had 
Ollie, who took $5,000 of cash, kept it under the mattress, had a $6,000 loan, pocket money of $10. Bo had some, he only had $5 in cash, uh, put his money in an IRA and had the same loan. Chandra paid off the loan except for $1,000, no money, so to, uh, to speak of. And Devin, who uh, put $4,000 in an IRA, reduced the loan by uh, $1,000 at 5,000 left in the balance. Now, 20 years later, you don't have to worry about the calculation. I just want to set the stage here. 20 years later, with inflation at 3% and a 10% compound annual growth rate in the S&P and loan interest of 7%, you can see these outcomes are radically different and surprising. So when they got back here, realized 20 years had passed, the purchasing power of that $5,000 had shrunk to almost half. That means you could buy half as much cat food, half, half, as, uh, half a size pizza, whatever, with the same dollars. Shocking. And the loan balance had ballooned. And so if you look at everyone's net worth uh, across the total here, almost everybody got punished, except for Bo, who invested in the IRA, and Devin, who invested in the IRA. Now, they both had the same return. But what I want to point out is Bo put his money in an IRA. And so to take it out, he faces a tax rate of about 40%, an income tax rate. So he ended up negative also. So this shows the power of tax and compounding. And I'll just, I'll skip ahead. Here's a, another slide where, um, wait, did I get that right? Uh, those are the same slides, so I'll move on. Now, with that stage set, let's talk about how you can be smart with your investing and manage money over time. Now, I said fire hose in the description, and you all signed up, so I hope you're ready to strap in your seatbelts, wake the kids, phone the neighbors, gather the family around your screen, because it's about to start, okay? Okay. Now, if you have questions and you really can't take it, throw your hands in the air. I'll try to see it. Um, or I think there's a raise your hand signal. Now, first, let's talk about life in general. When you were at MIT and left for a job, you were probably a lot like this person, Jimmy Nickel. Jimmy Nickel, who most people don't know, toured with the Beatles, I think for about six weeks when, uh, is it Ringo? Yeah, Ringo was the drummer, I guess, who um, he had some medical condition and he couldn't travel. And so this guy was rocking with the best. And I think that's how we should all think of MIT. I, I know everybody uh, had a lot of great classmates and good fun. At some point, his work ended. This is a famous shot of him waiting for a flight. And if you can imagine sort of the, the change he went through, sort of like graduating, um, he's like, all right, now I got to find work and I got to do things. And eventually, old age happens. And although this may not be fun to think about all the time. The alternative is worse. So let's talk about all stages of our life and investing, which includes early career, mid-career, and old age. So first to set the stage and how you want to think about things. When you're first starting out, you have many years of steady income ahead of you. That income is like a bond. It's always going to pay regular amounts it's not going to grow appreciably, although you'll change jobs. But fundamentally, you have to work to get it. It comes in regularly. And this is a smart time to take higher risks. You don't want to throw your money away, but you want to. This is a good time to explore startups. And we'll talk about, we'll talk about that a little later. Live cheap for a few years. Save as much as possible to get out of debt. But this is when you can really put time on your side. So it's a great time to make some important financial decisions. In the mid period of your career and your life, um, you'll have a lot of steady income ahead of you, still like a bond. Usually it's very low risk if you have an established career. However, you often have a lot of cash requirements like a mortgage and college tuition for kids if you have them. This is a smart time to save money uh, for a 401k and an IRA and things like that. Now, um, I will be sharing the slides and I think this video will be available, so please, Sit back, relax, let the ride begin, and uh, don't worry about copying things down because you can get it later and I'll be happy to talk to you as well. Um, now in older age, you should have many years of living after retirement, and that's a smart time to allocate your risks carefully. So 
this is a horribly complicated slide, but I just want to throw it up so you can kind of get a picture of things. In your 20s to 30s, the first priority you want to take care of on the left-hand side is a lean living reserve. And that's the same for your whole life. Lean living reserve means you need to have about six to 12 months to cover the basic expenses, things like a mortgage and rent, uh, food, medical insurance, all those things. And this, by the way, this isn't eating out at big expensive restaurants. This is, I know I've got a problem, I'm gonna live cheaply, and you should have enough for six to six to 12 months, ideally. And you know, I think COVID has really brought this to light, folks. Most people, if you if your job didn't survive in COVID, have had to deal with this and maybe go into savings. So that's an important step. Next, as you build wealth, you want to look at getting rid of debt, non-mortgage debt in particular. And so you want to look at filling these required buckets from the left to the right. And it changes a little bit at, at different ages, but not so much. In fact, really from your 20s to uh, you know 50 through 60, it's about the same, except that for the early, early careers in your 20s and 30s, I would recommend more risky investments. And we'll talk about that. And the one thing to highlight here, if I can, let's see if I got this right. Whoops. Sorry, let me go back. Um, let me get my ink on here. The, the one thing I want to draw your attention to is when you... Uh, get to a certain age that you have a lot of money left over and you know you're going to outlive, uh, sorry, you know you will not spend your money down to zero. You actually want to start taking more risk for the next generation. Most people don't do this. They think be very conservative. But if you're 90 years old and you have $5 million, odds are you're going to pass your, a lot of your wealth to the next generation. And therefore, the time horizon and the risk tolerance for that group is going to be much greater. I'll talk a little bit more about this. Now, um, two slides on this, and then we'll get into some technical stuff. So when you think about your overall wealth, one of the most important things you can think about are these three buckets. So first, the standard of living or personal risk bucket. That's very much the things you need to live on. At a minimum, these are going to be low income, uh, sorry, low risk, low return assets, cash, um, bonds, things like this. After you've filled that bucket and you don't want to overfill it, you want to put the money into the market risk bucket. And that's an area where you're going to earn market returns, get a lot of growth and appreciation. And when you get to a certain level of wealth and are comfortable, you can take the higher risks with the aspirational bucket. And that's where you can do things like uh, buy stock in a startup start a business, and hold concentrated positions. The aspirational bucket, it doesn't matter so much if it's win or lose. And in general, you'll be fine um, without that. And it can be used to really help enhance your lifestyle. So again, on the low end of the risk scale, you have the personal risk bucket that protects your standard of living. And we're going to invest that bucket differently. You have the market risk which is to maintain your lifestyle, beat inflation, and uh, it should grow and get bigger here. There's no real limit to that. And when you've built enough that you have financial comfort, the aspirational risk bucket to enhance your lifestyle. Now, uh, I'll skip this. Okay. So what I wanna talk about now is the stages of money over your lifespan. And we're going to talk about debt, steady income, disruptions, wealth accumulation, retirement, certain big events. And in the first 30 minutes or so here, we're going to go through some of the mechanics of investing that will help you understand the motivation for these cash allocations. So first of all, your lifetime balance sheet, if you were to think about your life without regard to interest and inflation and things like this, you know you're going to have a certain amount of financial assets, you're going to have a certain amount of labor earnings, and hopefully you'll get a certain amount of social security benefits. And over your lifespan, you're also going to have these required spending amounts, which you can see here in the center, special expenses, housing, taxes. And the leftover is really dis discretionary spending. Now, most people don't think of their life all 
added together like this because there's so many unknowns. But one of the things that we can control is how much we distribute from our labor earnings into our financial assets and how hard those assets work for us so we have more discretionary spending. And we always want to take care of the uh, situation where there could be something unusual that happens and befalls us that consumes more money than we thought. So quick thing about money and value. Money, folks, is a currency. It's a, it's a number. It's printed. But what you really do with money is buy things. And typically, those are goods and services, things that consume funds, or you purchase assets. And an asset is distinct from maybe goods and services that it's something you purchase for a later resell. You hope that it's liquid. And um, often it's illiquid that can't easily be converted to, to cash. So you can't sell your home in an hour, um, probably not even a day if you happen to need cash. It's considered illiquid. Um, and goods and services are things most people think of when they think of money to make them happy. Now, I wanna talk for a minute about buying power and happiness. One thing to think about is how you spend money. The less you spend, the more you save. And I will just ask you to take a second and think of five things that you spent money on five years ago that you still use or remember fondly. And this is an interesting test, if you will. Um, I've done some reading on books about enjoyment and funds and what gives the most bang for the buck. In general, I would say, a lot of people think that uh, travel and, and trips with family generate the best lasting return and happiness versus material items, but that's for you to think about. And um, the, the point here is that you'd be surprised what does and doesn't bring you happiness with your money and it's something worth thinking about. Now, let's start getting technical. Interest and inflation. So this graph is a chart of inflation from the Fed and it shows over the last 20 years, and you can see that inflation hovers around about 2%. It's been higher, it's been lower, it's lower now. Um, and this is something that the Fed has targeted. I'm gonna talk about that because it affects the purchasing power, which is what we use money for. So going back to this, um, there's a couple of different terms for interest rate. I don't wanna to get too technical, but the nominal or the named interest rate is what you see quoted here. Now, the real rate of inflation uh, is the effective rate relative to purchases. So let's talk about that, this and inflation a little more. But for now, to set it up, these are the rates right now on the treasury. So a one-year treasury is giving you 0.11% interest, and a five-year is giving you 0.38% uh, interest, and the 10-year gives you less than 1% interest. For treasury bond. Inflation right now for the last year or so has been at 1.2 percent. So if you take the if you take your money and you put it in a 10-year bond, you're going to earn less than one percent of interest and inflation is greater than one percent. That means the real rate of return is negative. And folks, this is a little bit unusual. This is a, a result of some of the stimulus and the very low interest rates, but this is a problem for savers and it creates problems in the market if it persists for too long. And this is generally what's regarded as something that drives asset bubbles because people uh, start to inflate prices when money is so cheap and purchasing an asset protects you against inflation. So let's talk a little bit about this. So let's say I have my eye on a house that costs $100,000 and I'm gonna wait a year if inflation is 2%, the price of that house in a year will be $102,000. This is straightforward, right? If I've kept my money under a mattress, my money will be $100,000 at the start of that year, and it'll be the $100,000 a year after. So if you think of a, a purchasing power as uh, points on the land, and your investment is sort of a, a river here, with a downstream flow because of inflation, you are losing ground at 2% a year if you're not paddling. Does this make sense? By paddling, I mean earning interest. Now, if the price of the treasury or if the treasury yield is 
then the gain you get in the treasury yield would match the gain in um, the housing prices. And it's as if you're anchored or paddling upstream uh, at a rate of 2% while the water flows down at, at uh, 2%. So you stay even, your purchasing power stays the same. Now, generally, when you talk about interest, you have to normalize it to what they call the risk-free rate. That's a rate you could comfortably invest and not have the fear that you're going to lose the money. And it's sort of the lowest, safest rate that you can get. So we'll talk a lot about that. Now, when you think about all of this and money, you want to think about a couple of things. So money is something that should work for you. And I, I've heard a lot of people that uh, are big savers talk about money as an agent of utility, like ants or soldiers that you send marching out to go build the colonies and come back and, and you reap the rewards for this. One of the problems with being very conservative, and I know we're all from MIT, so um, that often makes us very uh, risk aware, and that can lead to actually um, thinking a little bit too negatively about investing, but not everyone's that way. So the rest of the world uh, is sending their money out to work for them and get higher returns. And what this means is there's a natural tendency for prices to increase and functioning economies to count on people building wealth over their lifetime. If you keep your money under a mattress, it becomes less effective over time and you're going to have problems basically keeping up with the cost of inflation. So time is of the essence and it's very important to look at the time and the money you get. So that an ROI of 10% in a year is fantastic. ROI of 10% over a year, not so good. And we're going to talk about annualized return on investment. This is the formula. Just keep in mind that um, you can see here the, this power of compounding. And we'll talk a little bit more about it. Now, uh, I talked about inflation. And I want to talk about the good and bad sides to inflation. So remember that the price of the house is always going up. So if you think about it, you could buy 2% less house when inflation is 2% a year from now. And the only way to really get, get this working to your advantage is if you borrow money. So I'll talk a little bit about mortgages later, but when you borrow money, particularly money that has a long repayment time, you end up paying the last couple of dollars back 30 years from now, which means at a 2% inflation rate, you're paying back a dollar that had the purchasing power of only 55 cents versus today's dollar. And if the interest rate was 3%, it's only gonna be worth 41 cents of today's dollars. So a mortgage is actually a very good hedge against inflation. And um, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit, how that fits into your life plan. Now, let's talk about risk, friend or foe. Uh, most people want to earn a really good return, like a startup or own a stock that's going to go great. And they also want the security of no losses, things like cash, treasuries, and money markets. However, the yield and returns on these different classes of assets is very different. Now, Amazon's done fantastically. Webvan, not so good. And uh, junk bonds and bagel shops in the 90s were all uh, things that were sort of fads and people flocked into them with their money. And a lot of them lost money. So we need to think about taking intelligent risk. And now I'm going to switch to some graphics here. So this is going to set the stage for a lot of our discussions. And this is your life cycle economic balance sheet. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about this slide. What this is showing is if you took all the money you're going to earn over your entire career, and I'm assuming you retire at 55, and you discounted the value of that money at every year of your life. So if I looked at, if I sat at 23 after graduation, I looked at the value of all the money I'm going to get, and I, uh, I accumulate that to today's uh, dollars, it would be a million dollars more. And this is a, a very conservative sort of $40,000 a year salary because I didn't want people to be intimidated by the numbers. And this is exactly the reason why people tell you when you're young, you should buy 
uh, very aggressive stock portfolios for several reasons. First, you have many years of wealth accumulation for that, for that uh, investment to grow. And secondly, if you think of your overall life portfolio, you have nothing but cash, which looks kind of like a bond. So it's as if you're holding a portfolio of nothing but bond payments that you're going to be working to get, but you have no exposure to securities. And so it really doesn't make any sense if you're 23 to buy more than just a small amount of bonds. Now, if you're working and investing, your financial capital, which is this gray box here, will grow over time. It should peak about the time you retire. And then in retirement, you're going to withdraw the funds and it's going to diminish hopefully around the time you die and not before. And, um, and this is what's gonna fund a comfortable retirement for you. Now the blue uh, box here is real estate, which real estate also appreciates like an investment. So here's somebody's purchasing and you see this little hit to the savings. They purchased a house, but it's leveraged. So the value of the house grows over time. And, uh, and that will continue for the whole lifespan. And then here we have the uh, pension payments and social security, which has, uh, which doesn't start till you retire and it sort of has a, a constant value, but over time, uh, sort of as you get near, near your last year of living, if you will, you'll get your social security payments. And that's smaller than when you were looking back at, at first retirement at the bulk of all those payments put together. So that explains this graph. Now, these are all the components broken out separately so you can see it. And then here is a graph showed uh, by percentages. So you can see that the wealth you have when you start working is a 100% in your salary. When you retire, it's mostly in your uh, home and your investments. And by the end of your life, most of your wealth is gonna be in your, in your home if you, if you own a home and your, and your uh, on your investments. And this is probably one of the most important things to keep in mind. If you're early in your career, you want to think about the bond like nature of your income. If you're near retirement, you want to think about your peak investments, and the declining balance that you're going to have and the increasing importance of real estate and other assets that you may have accumulated. Now, uh, so summarizing again, the, on the left is the actual value, on the right is the percentage value. And this is just to be clear, as we build our lifetime portfolio of diversification, this is why we're favored for stocks at the beginning and at retirement, when we no longer have this bond-like income of a job, people convert to bonds and they have a higher allocation of bonds. Now. I guess I'll take a second. If there's any big questions, um, put them in the chat. Jason's monitoring that and we can see Jason, how are we looking? Give me a thumbs up if it seems like people are following along. Okay, let's take a deep breath. Now we're gonna talk about the time value of money. So here's some questions about dollars. If I have a dollar today, what's that dollar worth in a year? And the answer, because I'm not going to uh, delay and build up too much suspense, is the one-year risk-free interest rate. In other words, I can invest that dollar, and without a doubt, I will get the dollar back plus interest in a year. Uh, what's the dollar worth in five years? It's the five-year risk-free interest rate. And then this leads to some interesting questions. What did I need to invest a year ago to get a dollar today? It's the same interest rate, but actually given what the, the, the one-year treasury bill a year ago. And what did I need to invest 10 years ago to get to a dollar today? That would be the 10-year treasury bill interest rate issued. Uh, sorry, that would have been issued in uh, 2010. I'm not sure where that's 15. And what would I have paid five years ago for my million-dollar home in Silicon Valley? Well, that's determined by the compound annual growth rate between uh, September in 2015 and September in 2020. So these are different uh, interest rates and growth rates, all tied to various points in time. 
Hopefully that makes sense. Now, let's take a look at a graph of the time value of money given various interest rates. And this is straightforward. So folks, you know, this is a typical exponential graph at 0% interest. 20 years from now, I have the same thing as when I started. And at 12% interest, I have almost 10 times the amount of money compounding uh, yearly here. At 45 years, it's even more. And in fact, it's, it's almost off the charts and, and staggering. So here you have, you go from a dollar to $200. So this shows the power. And by the way, 45 years, if you're saving early in your 20s, that's 65. So time can be probably the most, time and compounding is the most powerful investment tool you have when you're investing. Now, Einstein said it best. He said, smart, smart money earns interest. Compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it earns it. He who doesn't pays it. And um, I think we'll see uh, as we go on how you can put this to work in helping your financial plan and, and building your wealth here. So one thing to think about when you look at this chart, 12% sounds like a lot. It's, it's not impossible to earn 12% in the market. In fact, the S&P has done close to 10 and 12% over 10 year periods uh, quite often. But the more important thing here is that I wanna talk about credit card debt. So credit card debt is almost always over 10%. And so this compounding works great if you're saving. And if you owe debt, this is something you wanna get rid of quickly. So moving forward, if you have debt, just to be clear, you should pay the highest interest debt off first. You should pay down the debt until your tax affected interest rate is lower than the after tax affected return rate. I'll talk about that in a little bit. And if you pay this debt off, that's cheaper tax wise than what you're earning in the market, it actually costs you money. Now, the one caveat here is you have to be very careful on relying on positive returns in the stock market because it can go up and down. But I wanna make sure this is clear. So credit card debt is usually very high. Often it's the thing you wanna pay off first. Car loan, not clear. Mortgage is usually the cheapest debt you can get and you get to tax, uh, tax affect it. In other words, you get to deduct a certain amount of your mortgage, making that payment even less. Mortgage rates are about three or 4% with some deductions, let's just say 3%. If you have a, a good bond portfolio, of quality, commercial, you know, decent grade bonds, you can probably get something like 3%. Um, and if you have a stock portfolio, most of the time, folks, it's going to earn more than your mortgage, which means you don't want to pay your mortgage off because you'll be taking dollars you could have invested in the stock market or a good bond portfolio and, and paying them down. And we talked about the fact that you have this advantage of paying deflated dollars 30 years from now with your mortgage. So you want to keep the money now and have it grow in your portfolio faster than the rate of inflation. I hope this is clear. Uh, now, let's talk about looking at the time value of money going backwards. So here, basically what we've done is we took these graphs and we lined up the endpoints, if you will. And we're going back and asking the question, what did it cost 30 years ago uh, to get to a dollar today? In other words, uh, how much money would I have to invest 30 years ago at these interest rates to wind up with a dollar 30 years later? So same graph, just different endpoints here. And you can see that it's very dependent on the interest rate. In fact, as the interest rate increases here around 10 and 12, you're paying between a nickel and seven, eight, eight cents over 30 years to get to a dollar today, okay? And here's the cost of a dollar looking back 10 years in time. Now, this is important. I wanna, for a couple of reasons, interest rates like this are gonna affect stock prices, mortgage rates, and all kinds of things. But this process of a dollar in the future and going looking backwards, what it takes to get to a dollar is critical to understanding your financial decisions. So 
uh, take a look here. The 10 year, if we look back over a 10 year timeline, 30 cents at 12% interest will get you to a dollar. And if the interest rate is only 2%, you have 80 cents. Now, this is a subtle point here, but um, I'll get to it in a second. We're basically asking what is the value of a dollar in the future um, discounted for the currently available available interest rates. And there's no risk here if the dollar, uh, sorry, if the interest rate is steady over that 10 year period. So the value of a dollar in 10 years is lower when the interest rate is high and it's higher when the interest rate is low. And it's equal to exactly a dollar when the interest rate is zero. I hope this makes sense. Now, let's talk about Thanksgiving dinner. You're there with your whole family at the table and your favorite uncle offers you $1,000 in 10 years or $600 today. Here's the question. You, can't ignore, uh, you can ignore the formulas for now, but the answer depends entirely on the interest rate that's available to you or the earning rate that's available to you. So if the interest rates are just a tiny bit less than 5%, you'll end up earning a bit less at the end of 10 years, let's say $10 less. And so the question is, which, which should I take, $600 today or the $1,000 in 10 years? And so if you can earn 12%, you would have $2,000 in 10 years. You definitely wanna take the $614 today and if you can only earn two and a half percent, then you would have $786 in 10 years. So the answer is you can't know which has better value unless you have a forecast for the interest rates here. And at two and a half percent, it's worth $780 today. The $600 is lower, so you're better off waiting for 10 years. Does this make sense? I don't, I'm not getting a lot of feedback, but I'm hoping people are following along. Now, um, so I know this, this example seems a bit belabored, but the point here is that this is the exact same procedure for pricing a zero coupon bond. And this is what the bond market does every day in the stock market as investors are placing bets on interest rates and trying to grow their dollars as fast as possible. So a zero coupon bond, just to introduce this, and then we'll take a, a minute or two is an agreement that the holder of the bond will receive the face value of the bond over a particular time. So if it's 10 years, these are usually denominated in $1,000. You can buy a zero coupon bond for 10 years out from now, it would be 2030, and it will trade at a discount. And the discount it trades at will be exactly, essentially the interest that you're going to get on that bond. So if you pay 80 cents on the bond or 78 cents, you get a 2% interest uh, rate over that period. If you pay 60 cents, you get a 5% interest rate, et cetera. So here, the price of the bond with 5% interest is $613. At 1% interest, the price of that bond will trade for $900 in the market. Now, this, uh, this formula here, the face value of the bond, that's our $1,000, and the interest rate and the number of years of compounding is what we use to price uh, the time value of money. So this, uh, this formula shows I can compute the future value given a present value and an interest rate and a compounding period. And I can compute the present value of some money in the future. This is just the, the same formula with the inverse here, the division we should all be familiar with. So this is the exact formula for the zero coupon bond that we talked about with n equals one, because it's as if we assumed compounding for a year, face value of a thousand. Those are the numbers here and here. So what this allows us to do is to look forward and backwards in time and say the value of money is heavily dependent on interest rates. And in fact, the value of cash flows are uh, 
very much um, determined by the interest rates. And so this is independent of inflation. And it's important, this is always a risk-free, these are always risk-free calculations. Now, let's take a minute and think about this. So if I know the interest rate, and I know the amount of time I'm going to lend money or get money back, then I am indifferent to these different values of taking $600 today or $1,000 in 10 years. But you don't know the interest rates. That's something that's dynamic. And so there's some risk there. And I'm going to talk about uh, two more things, and then I think we'll be at a good time to take a break. So if you have the, I'll skip that. If you have the time value of money and there's some risk to it, um, how do we value that cash flow? Now, I don't know. I'm going to switch to a second, switch a second here and see. Uh, let me get my camera up, see if there's more people. I guess uh, not everyone has their camera on, but in the, in the questionnaire I sent out, there was a, there was a little box where you could put in loaning money to people you don't know. So you had, you had from friends to, to friends and family, I think all the way out to a stranger or a startup where you didn't know the founders. And if you filled that out, one of the things I think you found was that um, if you're like most people, you probably said, I want a higher interest rate from the people that I don't know because I'm taking greater risk. And that's exactly what the market is doing all the time when it's pricing risk and pricing investments. So you might ask yourself, what is the value of a series of cash flows uh, some years out if there's a risk that I might not get paid back? And the answer is, it's a premium that looks a lot like the interest that's paid. And so that uh, the risk associated with your investment comes in here as a sort of like a pseudo interest rate. And a good way to think about it is it's a premium added to the risk-free rate and if you're lending, it's the amount above the risk-free rate you need to induce you to make the investment. And with that, we'll take a break, but I wanna remind you, money in the future is worth less when the risk-free rate of interest is high because you can earn a bigger interest rate. The discount rate is higher and money in the future is worth more when the risk-free interest rate is low because it's hard or impossible to earn as much interest. And folks, this is what's driving our stock market up it's driving the prices of a lot of assets up. And um, it's important to remember that as the risk-free interest rate moves up and down, the price of a pile of cash in the future moves up, moves down and up the reciprocal and the distance in time magnifies this effect due to the compounding. Let's see. And with that, I think I'll take a break. And if we can... All right, thank you. Uh... Okay, so uh, net present value is probably one of the more important computations that you should understand. This is the same as the discounting that we talked about for cash flows, but allows you to price uneven cash flows. And I just want you uh, to understand. Hey, you we need your slides when you're ready oh, to. Oh, sorry. Hang on, folks. And look, I think it's better if I go through as much as possible and leave you with a few questions we can follow up on than to miss something. So I'm going to go as fast as I can. <laughs> Hang on. There's a lot here, but hopefully something is new and useful for you. So if you can, can everybody see my screen now? All right, great. So the net present value is uh, a way to value cash flows in the future. And the, the math here is basically we're discounting each cash flow by the years and in, in how long it takes to get it. And the important thing here is this is actually like a, a, a payout for a bond or many things pay out this way, uh, where you get an interest payment and then you get the, the amount that you loaned back. Um, but what's important here is this, the green part, I wanna stress this, the green part is the, the discount that you give to that cash and it's not based on anything other than the fact that you could have earned that risk-free at the interest rate, which is also known as the discount rate. So the green is the discounted amount. It's what you could have done with the money with no risk if you hadn't loaned it. So it's, uh, it's not really a reward because you could have had it another way. And so the green portion grows with time and the interest rate 
um, in this example is fixed, but the reality is the interest rate is going to going to vary, and so um, the amount of discount here is much more important. Proportion it's it's bigger proportionally the farther away you get, and so the net present value basically when you look at this you say all right somebody tells me they're going to give me a hundred dollars each year, but in reality the dollars I get far away depending on the interest rate here five percent are really only worth sixty two dollars because I could have earned the other 38 by investing it, okay? So this helps you make an informed decision about the total value. And you can see here the value, the value of the firm uh, being $1,000 with these payouts. So something to keep in mind. Now businesses use net present value to evaluate things like building a factory, investing in R&D, leasing or owning a fleet of delivery trucks, and these are own cost to capital, which is the rate at which they can borrow money in this calculation, not the risk-free rate, since that's the price they pay for borrowing. And in a sense, the cost of capital is the interest rate they get paid to not borrow the money, if you're following me. And one source of capital for companies is bonds. Now, another thing to stress is that you can value any cash flow using the same equation. So if your borrowing rate is, uh, is different than the risk-free rate. You might want to use that in your calculations. You can use this to value a series of dividends that a gross stock pays, or you can use it to value the revenues of a, of a company. And you can use it to value all the cash you would get if you built a toll road like the Golden Gate Bridge, and you knew about how much money you're going to get each year from all the people paying that. So let's talk about bonds. Bonds are basically a promise to repay money in the future and often with periodic interest. Um, we talked about this with the lending on the uncertainty of payment. So the more risk you had in getting the payment, the more premium you typically would demand. Here's some uh, bond jargon that's worth knowing. So treasuries often are, are referred to the U.S. government bonds and um Corporate, corporate bonds, sovereign bonds. Bonds can be denominated in dollars or other currencies, which means somebody in London can borrow money and have to pay it. They can borrow dollars and have to pay it back in dollars. And a basis point is one hundredth of a percent. You'll hear people talk about basis points. And the spread is the difference in the yield uh, between bonds. And it's often a proxy for risk. So in other words, the spread between treasuries and commercial bonds gives you a measure of the risk in the commercial bonds market. Bonds are rated by risk of default, which is the risk that they don't pay. Different agencies over here have different ratings. So you see Moody's, Fitch, and S&P. They usually involve A's, B's, and C's. You can imagine they started with that. They realized there weren't enough uh, gradations between them. So there's these different nomenclatures. And um, and this shows you the cumulative risk of default. So bonds do default, but it's rare. And you can see here the AAA bonds uh, at a corporate uh, have defaulted about half a percent, whereas these uh, B-rated bonds and C-rated bonds have much higher default rates. And then the average, they give you the average here. Investment and non-investment grade, I think the division is around uh, BAA or so. So it's sort of, sort of around this line. Anyway. Just something to think about here. Uh, some more jargon, people often refer to short-term bonds as paper. You can think of it as an IOU, notes, treasury, treasuries and T-bills. I think the T-bills have a less than three year maturity. And then in terms of bonds, there's a zero coupon bond, which means you get no coupon payments, just all the money at the end. Coupon bonds with a standard payment schedule is six, six months, although there's other payments. And treasury inflation, tips or treasury inflation protected securities where in addition to the payment, the coupon payment you get, they actually look at the inflation over the period and they give you uh, a payment uh, uh, adjusted for your the principal that you've put in. Uh, the zero coupon bond was what we talked about pricing at the Thanksgiving dinner table. You're making a loan to get a fixed amount of interest on a specific date, uh, a fixed payout, if you will. Since the payout and the date are known, the amount you pay for this determines the interest rate over the time period. And I won't go into this too much, but the river analogy here is with the bond, you, you know how much water distance, if you will, upriver you're gonna go, but you don't know the, the ground speed. 
um, uh, relative to the ground, which is what inflation is going to do to your your investment over time. Um, let's see. Uh, Jason, are we recording this? Or, or, what, yeah, we're good. Okay. Uh, now, to, just to clarify, zero coupon bonds, coupon bonds, most bonds people buy are coupon bonds. Uh, zero coupon bond pays a single lump sum at a specific time. It's very easy to value using the present value formula. And um, treasury bonds uh, are as close to the risk free rate as you can get. These are sold in auctions. Now, you might ask yourself, What's the value of a zero coupon bond? And it's actually very valuable for something like a business when you know a certain payment's due. So if you know in, a, in five years, I have to make a $10 million payment for something, buying a zero coupon bond is a great way to sort of fix your price and know that you'll have that available at a certain time. So it's a way to borrow and um, uh, match your cash flows with your liabilities here. And with all of the treasuries and, and these rates here, you're secured by the full faith and credit of the USA. It's the one instrument you're allowed to say is more or less risk-free. Um, and coupon bonds, uh, all shapes and sizes, uh, from government debt to corporate debt, they can have varying terms. They may or may not be secured with assets. And while most issuances have many bonds, there are great differences between the issuances. For example, Ford might issue a coupon bond secured against the company assets in a year. And they may also offer unsecured bonds that are callable in the next year. And by the way, when I say callable here, that means the person who holds the bond can actually call it back and say, you know what? Don't want to pay that interest. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to pay it all back because I can refinance at a lower rate, kind of like a mortgage. Um, so let's see. So, Going back just to review here, a bond is debt that is secured and a stock is a claim on dividends and a portion of the proceeds in a company. So stocks can go to zero, but bonds get paid back with the highest priority. In other words, if you're a bondholder in a company and the company goes bankrupt, those assets will be divided and given to the bondholders in most cases. So let's talk about all the risks associated with this bond. And this... Uh, there's a whole bunch here on this slide, but I, I want to talk about two things as an investor that I think are important. And the first is the term premium. So when I lock in an interest rate for 10 years, what's the risk? Well, I'm hoping that maybe the rates are going to go lower, in which case my bond will have been a good investment because I bought a bond that's going to yield, let's say, 5%. If the rates go down to 3%, I'm earning more than I could earn had I not bought the bond for 10 years. That seems like a great deal. But if I buy a bond at 5% and the interest rates go to 8%, now I'm stuck. I'm stuck with that yield for 10 years. And there's really, as the bondholder, there's not much I can do. You'd say, well, Don, why don't I sell the bond because I don't like that it's only earning 5%. And the problem is when you go to sell it, everybody in the market says, you know what? I can earn 8% now. So I'm gonna discount the price of that bond to the point where it yields 8%. So the term premium is really the risk that you have of holding the bond and being subject to the fact that the interest rates could go up, be more attractive, and you're, you're locked in. Liquidity premium is that it's not easy to sell a lot of bonds um, from corporations. So for example, treasuries are very liquid. Everybody knows their standard. Everybody knows what they yield, can calculate the price. It's very straightforward. But some sort of bonds like for, let's say, American Airlines that's secured with planes or something like this, it takes people time to figure out what that's worth. It, it could have issued eight years ago. It could, have be, it could be the case that very few of them have traded and none of them have traded in the last three or four months. So finding a buyer for a bond is not always simple. Um, and then there's downgrade premium. That's the risk that the bond is downgraded because the company is not doing well and things like this and, and the risk that the bond defaults. So for example, Apple sells bonds with a very cheap rate because nobody's worried about them being able to pay their debt. Uh, but Hertz Rent-A-Car had a problem. In fact, she filed for bankruptcy because they, they had too much debt on their, on their balance sheet. They couldn't service the debt, which means pay the debt. 
um, when some of the payments were due. Now, the bond risk is priced by the market. Treasuries don't have many of these risks, so it yields less. Investors price the risk in corporate bonds, and a key component of risk and yield is the term premium. We talked about that. And note that when rates rise, the price of the bond falls until it's yield until it yields the market rate of interest when adjusted for all the other risk factors. And this is showing you here, uh, if you think of a, a treasury bond, the, the term premium here on a treasury, since you know the cash flow is certain, you have a small premium here and you can look at the, the amount. And this is the spread relative to the 10 year government bond. And what you're seeing here is that for a B graded corporate bond or a triple B, uh, you're, you're seeing the additional interest that's basically tacked on. This was the risk component I showed you in that interest rate calculation for all these various components, liquidity being one of them. They all contribute to this fact that uh, the prices will be different. And one of the greatest things you can look at is uh, this chart here. A lot of investors look at this, which is the corporate triple B bond risk premium. This shows you the general view of a large pool of bonds, the risk people are pricing for repayment. So let's look at this. In January, things were marching along, doing fine. And you see the, the premium here was very low, say 1.4 or so percent. And it went as high as 4.8% uh, during COVID. And why did that happen? That happened because people said, things are shutting down in the economy. I don't know if I can be confident that the bond that I have uh, purchased is going to be paid. If the comp I don't know if the company is going to make the payments that are due. And so this gives you a, a measure of how people, how confident people feel the repayments are. And then it drifted down over time. And now we're back to more or less normal rates because companies are, are making their payments. All right. Uh, one other thing about bonds, it's kind of confusing. Bonds are quoted, uh, most, most bonds quote fixed payment amounts. So the borrower has a, a known payment that it can budget. In other words, I say, um, let's think about a municipality. I want uh, $3 million for, for schools or $3 billion for schools. And I wanna pay a certain amount of interest each year and so you, you go to the market and you say, all right, at 5%, these are my payments. And they know that for the next 30 years, they will be paying a 5% interest rate on that money and they can budget for it. And it makes it very simple. Now the interest rates could go up and down, but since a bond is a fixed payment instrument, it's very easy for them to budget. So it's the investors that end up with the variability in price. And that's because the yield, which is what you get uh, in, the, in the market, is constant on your money. So the price goes up and down until uh, if they match. Sorry, I'm, I'm going through that a little. Let's go through it this way. The annual coupon payment of the bond over the price of the bond gives you the current yield. And the, that yield is fixed for the investment you made. But as the market moves around, uh, the price will fluctuate such that the yield to maturity of all those payments is adjusted. And I, if this isn't clear, we can, um, we can talk more about it later. Uh, the yield curve, which is a measure of the interest rates over time, the term structure of interest rates, it shows the typical interest rate charged uh, for three month, two year, 10 year and 30 year bonds. And in a normal yield curve, the rate you pay for out here in the future, like 30 years is higher than the rate you pay in a year, mostly because of what we, we call the term premium risk. The risk that interest rates will rise, the risk that cat catastrophic events will happen. It says if I'm gonna loan you money for 10 years, I should get paid more in interest than if I loan it to you for a year because a lot could happen over 10 years, including interest rates changing. A flat curve is, uh, is a strange result where the short-term rates go high and the long-term rates get lower and an inverted curve uh, looks like this. Now, let's talk about this for a second. In a normal healthy yield curve, 
uh, economy is generally humming along. You know, what would make somebody, what would cause the yield curve to flatten? So if I think that things are going to be bad for 10 years and the economy is going to falter, one of the things I would do is I'd lock in a good rate today because I think there's not going to be healthy growth in the future. That means as more people buy a 10-year bond, the yield on that bond goes down. So this could be driven down by pricing the law of supply and demand. Everybody starts buying these longer-term bonds at higher rates, pushing the prices up. And that means the yields down. And that's what happens here is that people say, I don't have confidence in the economy. Uh, I'm going to lock in some rates now. And then in a inverted uh, yield curve, you have sort of the same thing going on at an even higher rate. And this is a good example of the yield curve over four, let's look at four times here. So in February, let me just move this out of the way. February, 2011, things were humming along. Banks were lending you money at 4%. They were paying you, you know, maybe a little over zero. And, you know, at, for two years, CDs were paying 1%. So they were making money in 2000, something happened. The 30-year the rates went lower than the two-year rates. And the same in October 2007. Now, let's look at what could have been happening at those times. So 2000, we had the dot-com bust. And in 2008, we had the credit crisis. And so you can see here the uh, this metric, which I want you to know, this is the the 10 year versus the three month treasury. So people talk about twos and tens or the, the, the yield curve steepness. This going back is the, is basically this, this metric that I'm showing you is the distance between these two yielding points here. So I think you, I think that's clear. So you can see here, the yield flattened went negative. So this is a negative yield curve here, right before the dot com. This is a, uh, around the credit crisis time here. And you'll also notice that the, these, gray, uh, these uh, gray bands here are sort of recession. You'll see that the yield curve dips down and sometimes nothing happens. So it's not definitive answer that there's gonna be a, a recession, but it often portends a recession here. Now, for personal finance reasons, let's talk about the best time to refinance. Do you want to refinance when the economy is healthy? Or do you want to refinance when things look bad? So the answer is you want to refinance when things look bad. Uh, this is why having a job and steady income can really help you out a lot, particularly when, when times are bad, because you can, you can refinance and uh, lock in a much lower rate. Now, if the yield, you can think of the yield curve as sort of pivoting back and forth here. But when it's down, this is the best time to, uh, to refinance your mortgage. Let's see, if, let's see if there's anything else I want to talk about. I guess the one other thing to mention here is that you hear a lot about the Federal Reserve doing things with interest rates. They operate at the short end of the curve, usually less than three years or so. Um, and just to talk about bond investors. So Stocks and bonds are interesting, but I'll tell you, bonds really give you more data because there's less variables with bonds. With bonds, people are betting on interest rates and the entities that are paying them. Stocks have a lot of other things going on with them. So um, bond investors spend all their time forecasting the economy, the interest rates, and the risk of default and other premiums, and they vote with their wallets. This was the British pound curve in 2005. It's very unusual. It's from Wikipedia. Um, and I want to talk, let's see. And so I think that's all I want to say about that. Now I'll talk about one of the more important things with bonds, because if you're going to invest in bonds, you need to know about duration. And the duration is a metric that tells you how much that bond is sensitive to interest rate changes. And I'll, I, I put this graph, this graphic together so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. So at the top here, we have a zero coupon bond. The duration, in other words, it, it, the duration is giving you a metric of how much the cash flow is going to be discounted uh, effectively. 
the duration for a zero coupon bond is just the, the time to maturity of the bond. So if it's a 10 year bond, the duration is 10 years. And for a coupon bond, it's a little different because you have all these cash flows. And what you, the way to think about duration basically is if you put all the cash flows on a, on a teeter totter, it's the balance point or, or the, the, full, the point here where those flows would, would balance. That's essentially the, the effective duration or Macaulay duration. There's, always, there's many different metrics for this. But what I want you to know is if a bond pays more interest, it has a payment structure like this on the bottom, the duration is going to be shorter than a bond that makes no payments up here, like the zero coupon bond or a bond with very small coupon payments. So lower yielding bonds tend to have longer duration and the ones that, that you higher yielding bonds uh, with higher coupon payments relative to the amount lended have a shorter duration. And the reason you care about this is that for every 1% change in the market interest rate, the bonds price will change approximately 1% in the opposite direction for every year of duration. So there's the formula. I got some examples to show you here. So let's say I'm investing in a bond fund. I say, okay, I'm, I've reached retirement. I want to increase my bonds. Should I buy the bond fund with a seven-year average duration or the bond fund with a three-year uh, average duration? Well, the results are going to be very different uh, in the portfolio depending on the interest rate movement. So if the interest rate, which is about say 0.6 right now, moves to 2.5, then you can see this bond is portfolio is going to have a loss of 13% if the duration is seven years. And if the if it's a shorter duration bond fund of three, then I'm going to have like only a five or six percent loss. And then convexity here, it, it's a little more complicated this, but just remember what's the slope of one over X where you know price is one over the interest rate when X goes to zero. And this is why you see prices go crazy in the bond market. To put this in perspective, folks, this is the interest rate we're at now. And this is over, what is this, 30, 40 years? Uh, so I recommend you think very carefully before you buy into a lot of bonds, particularly a long dated bond, because there's just not much more room for this to go down. And there's a lot of room for it to go back up. All right, parting thoughts on bonds. Go with short duration funds. Don't lock in a losing rate. Real returns are negative right now. It's a, different, it's a difficult and different time in the bond market. Alternatives to bonds are dividend stocks, higher yielding corporate bonds, and real estate, which has a bond-like payment structure. Now, more sprinting. <laughs> Everyone's on board. Stocks and portfolios. Uh, hang on a second. Let me see here. Yeah, uh, I'll talk about some mortgage and other stuff. So Stock market is a collection of people doing their best to be smart investors. It doesn't wish anybody malice, but it does punish poor decisions. Uh, it hates uncertainty about looming changes, COVID-19 and election fears. The stock market is forward looking, usually six months to a year. That's why we can have a rally during COVID, even though the, the times look grim. It's patient for about the same amount of time and the market evaluates potential and provides risk capital when it thinks it will be compensated. So let's talk about companies. What makes a good investment? There's three things I think about companies, the size of the market, the management, and the margin. What are the risks in a company? Market could shrink. Management can make bad decisions like Enron. The profit margin could decline. And various factors like input costs, global trends. These risks are called idiosyncratic risks. Now I'm going to speed through some of this. The rewards in companies, some stocks pay dividends. Stock price could appreciate their special dividends. Costco announced a $10 dividend to the shareholders. You get a vote in the management of the company. And in general, you better uh, the world or society when you give capital to people that do good things with it. So remember, if bond was, a, was debt, the stock is a claim on dividends and the profits. What is a stock? It's a, a unit or a share of ownership that you get in a corporation. It entitles you to some of the profits. It gives you a vote. And the most important thing is you don't have liability with a bond. And this was a, in the history of human commerce, this was a new thing invented in the 1600s. Said, hey, we're gonna allow people to invest. They're not quite owners in the sense that I can't blame them for problems, but they're, they're not gonna, they're just gonna get the upside. Now, 
Let's talk about a startup. Would you like one share of company A or a million shares of company B? Don't answer, folks, because what matters is your percentage of ownership in the company, which is the shares you own over the total outstanding shares. Now, there's something here I want you to remember. It's like asking, when you think of a company, number of shares is like slices of pizza. Now, humans have this problem with big numbers. So if you say, how many slices do you want your pizza cut into? Human's going to say, you know what? I'm feeling hungry. Better make it 12. The joke here is, did you get any more pizza by having it in 12 slices? No. But people want more stock. And I actually started a company one time, and I only had 5,000 shares of stock. And I remember, ultimately, I ended up changing it <laughs> because everybody wanted bigger numbers, even though the percentages were the same. And I, folks, I was hiring smart people, and they couldn't get around that sort of bias, if you will. Stocks come in different series, common, preferred. Within a series, they're all the same. One note about Silicon Valley. In the 70s, preferred stock was traditionally valued at 120th. Oh, sorry. Uh, I've got that backwards. I'm sorry. Common stock was 120th to 110th that of preferred. This is what gave companies the ability to grant cheap options. This is where the leverage came in joining a startup. Over time, the common stock value rises to be close with that of preferred and at events, it's usually kind of drifted. This, by the way, is what allows companies to issue cheap options. Um, there's some words about that. Now, talk about the balance sheet briefly. Capital structure, assets, debt and equity. Uh, let's skip through this. One thing to note here about the capital structure, particularly with startups. So you could have two companies sold for $70 million and if the preferred stock in the first startup is $10 million, they get paid back. You have $60 million to divide among your 10 million shares. That's $6 a share. Hooray. If the company is capitalized with a lot of preferred stock already, it sells for the same amount of money here. Preferred shareholders generally get paid back first. Then the money gets split. Only $5 million left over after, after paying off bonds and other things. You get $0.50 cents a share. That's not a, as good an outcome as $6 a share if you have the same amount of shares. So this is why capital structure is important. Uh, some companies have a lot of debt. That makes them risky. Others have very little debt. Usually makes it safe. Um, some metrics for stocks, earnings per share, price to earnings and multiples. Uh, let me go through this. I, this will be on the slides. But let me just say one thing here with Walmart. Um, you can calculate the earnings per share on Walmart, uh, $4 of earnings, the price to earnings ratio and get a yield. Walmart folks, uh, based on earnings, now you don't get this, but based on stock is earning 4.8%. How much was the treasury bill giving you? Less than a percent. So if you have a choice to put your money in bonds or stock, this looks like a good time to buy stocks. And this is one of the things that's driving the value up. I'm going to talk about some intuition with stock prices um, using this thing called the perpetuity. So here's the interesting thing. If I said to somebody, you know, I got all this money laying around. What I'd really like to get is $20 for the rest, $20 a, mo a, a year for the rest of my life for every $100 I give up. And they say, you know what? Interest rates are 20%. I'll take that deal because if you give me $100 and I can earn 20% on it, I'll give you $20 a month. Now, the calculus is different when the interest rate is only 1%. There, to get $20 a month, I'd have to have $2,000 to give to someone. Is this clear? So this is a, a, a funny thing called the perpetuity, and this is the formula. It says the present value of a constant payment forever is basically that payment divided by the interest rate. So. When you think about a stock, it's a company, it's always doing business, it's always earning money. So the perpetuity formula is kind of applies. You have this one exception here, but it's the growth of the company actually changes the divisor a little bit. So if you look at uh, a company here that's earning $3 or pays a $3 dividend, has growth potential of 5% a year, and the interest rate is 8%, that stock is worth $100. Now, folks, again, the interest rate, sort of like pi in equations, keeps showing up. And the point here is low interest rates make the value of the cash flows higher. 
and that makes the price of stocks higher. So if you look at um, if you look at this relationship, this is why our economy is booming. To put this in perspective, stocks, while very expensive in the market being high, from a relative yield perspective, the dividend on the S&P relative to a 10-year treasury is probably the highest it's been since the 40s. This is what's keeping the rally going today, folks. And while the Fed keeps rates low, and Fed Chairman Fed Powell said he's going to, this is what has people chasing yields in stocks, and including using stocks instead of bonds to get their income, because the bonds are yielding negative real interest rates or very low interest rates. I know that's a bit complicated, but um, let's keep running through it. <sighs> okay. <laughs> now, I'm going to go through this really fast because I want to get on to some personal finance stuff. And there's only a few minutes left, but I'll, I'll go long if people will stay with and feel free to jump off if you have to. But um, portfolios and diversification. Here's a problem with the stock market. These are all the different sectors, international stocks, real estate, et cetera. And this is the year at the top. Can you pick a trend here or a particular winner? You can't. It's very hard to know which sector is going to perform. So John Templeton said, to avoid having all your eggs in the wrong basket at the wrong time, every investor should diversify. And this, this classic pattern here, it's called the quilt. If you look at it, the quilt of returns, it shows you that over time, it's going to be really hard to pick what does well. For example, emerging markets, 18% one year, minus 9% the, uh, you know, in the start of, of 2020 here. So let's diversify. Now, Einstein's eighth wonder of the world was compounding interest. I'm going on record, folks, the Don Hain and ninth wonder of the world is diversification. So this is, this is a complicated formula, which um, shows you the effect of, of the effect on risk of adding a number of securities to your portfolio. And for those of you that know a little bit about this, this formula, I'll, I'll say it once, which is the variance of your portfolio goes down with the addition of each stock uh, by the by one over N with the difference between the, the variance of that stock and the covariance of the portfolio and tends to, in the final stages, the covariance between all the stocks. So what this means is, if you have a stock with a with a, a standard deviation of say 68%, which was the average in New York stock in about 1975, and a covariance with other stocks of, of 27%, say, as I add a bunch of them, only that, even only 20 stocks, I get very close to reducing that risk to the uh, average covariance, which means you have prevented these huge swings in your return just by adding a 20, 20 stocks. So that is sort of the ninth wonder of the world in my book. So even just 10 stocks has a fraction of the risk of one stock. And more importantly, this is the most important thing I think to take in this section is because combining stocks is essentially free, you don't get paid for the idiosyncratic risk that happens when you hold a single stock. So basically, you're not compensated for that risk, so you shouldn't take it, which means always have a portfolio of at least 10, 20 or more stocks. Uh, covariance, I don't know what to say about this. The, the thing to keep in mind here is when I add two, two things together, I get the variability they have and this term here, the covariance, which if it's negative, reduces the overall variation in the portfolio. So let's look at this graphically. I'm going to do this fast, but folks, we all went to MIT, so I think we should we can handle it. If I have two stocks on a on a graph of the return on the x-axis and the variance on the y-axis, I can shift between having 100% in A, 100% in B, and if their correlation is one, there's no difference in the risk. If their correlation is negative one, I can blend these two in such a way that while A, remember, A goes up, B goes down. If I get the balance just right, the variance will be zero. 
And this is an important result. So with two stocks that are negatively correlated, I can find a balance point where I will have no risk and get a return from those stocks. And if you think about the, the varying degrees of, of correlation here, or covariance, these at half, you get something like this. With zero, you get this blend. And if you string it all together, folks, you get uh, what we call the efficient frontier, which is the best mix of stocks you can pick to get the most reward for a certain amount, a given amount of risk. Now, any stock that's not on, the, any portfolio that's not on the efficient frontier uh, is suboptimal in the sense that you can get a greater average return by moving higher. That'll give you more return for the same risk. Or you can take less risk and earn the same amount by moving out here to the frontier. So there's a lot of math behind this. The short version here is different mixes of stocks and bonds give you this curve. You have the risk-free rate down here and different mixes of cash and the single best portfolio defined here, it's called it's sometimes called the tangent portfolio, is the best way to invest. There's a lot of math here, folks, but we can talk about it more. The important formula is the sharp ratio, which is basically telling you a metric of the reward you get for unit of risk taken. And it's the reward is defined as the return of the portfolio over the risk-free rate. All right, so what does this look like in practical terms? Portfolio Visualizer, it's a free tool. I, I, I sometimes like to use it, for example. I can put in a bunch of stock positions here. You can see a real estate investment trust and other things. This is what the allocation looks like. When I use this mean variance opti uh, optimizer, it changes the allocation for me. And it's showing you, uh, here you go. It's showing you the position of all of these. It's a little hard to see. All of these positions, so you can look, you actually mid cap stocks not that far from the efficient frontier uh high yield bonds large cap european stocks very far away but if i blend them in the right ratios i get the returns out on this on the frontier and you'll see uh, let me go back here this shows the return i can get at various points with the mix of stocks so let's just point out one thing here reits are earning 19% so for the best yield in my portfolio, I have a little bit of them, but not so much. At 6%, I only need a little bit to get the best return for the lowest risk. And by the way, the short-term investment grade had very low risk. So you can see that I'm going to, this portfolio optimization says, I'm going to keep the low risk investment as long as possible until it's impossible to get the yield or the earnings I want here. Uh, and then I switch to these higher and high, the, the per percentage of higher and higher risk uh, instruments. So at any given point, this blend is telling you the best mix of instruments to get a given a given return. All right. Uh, it's a complicated subject, but hopefully this, this is helpful. Now, what does this mean? Asset allocation, which is the, the mix, picking this mix and percentage is critical. So in fact, it turns out it's actually one of the single most determinative factor in total returns. It matters more than the individual stocks you pick. And I wanna say one thing here for MITers. Target dated funds adjust the ratio of stocks and bonds over time. These are for the average investor and not the average MITer. So they neglect the current income and are generally a little too conservative. Bottom line is if your salary is stable and high and more bond-like, I think you should pick a target dated fund that's a little further out. It should have more stock in it. You can check the perspective, call me, we can talk about it. But in general, uh, I wanted to go over this. Here's the Vanguard ETF fund that is the S&P 500. Folks, it earned over 10 year average, oh, sorry, 10 year average, earning about 14%. And if you put $10,000 in it 10 years ago, you get about $35,000 today. Now, this is the 60-40 bond allocation. 10 years earned 7%. And if you put $10,000 in it today, you get about $21,000. So this difference in allocation uh, can have a huge impact on your retirement. Now, okay, one quick thing here. 
This is a Monte Carlo retirement simulator. And all these numbers are the same except for the average annual investment return. Here you see what happens when you have six, uh, a 6% return, and here's a 10% return. Now this next slide is 200 simulations of that portfolio. Oh, by the way, let me go back. So this is for like California here. So we start with $2 million. Be nice if everybody has that. $10,000 withdrawn every month, okay? So we're taking money out of our portfolio and it's earning money. This shows you all the various paths. Some paths lead to lots of money and wealth. Others lead to running out of money. And this shows you the difference of the number of paying scenarios. So 76% are still paying after 20 years when we were earning 6%. But with the 10, whoops, with the uh, yeah, 6%, with the 10%, 100% are still paying. So these small percentages in your retirement amounts make a huge difference in the outcome. And by the way, the scale here, just to point out, the scale here is very different. So um, you should care about every single percentage that you're earning over time because it has huge implications for how much you can withdraw in your retirement. One other thing about portfolios, just to kind of wrap this up a little bit, You'll hear people say things in the jargon like, well, I'm overweight, large cap stocks. What does that mean when somebody on the TV says that? Well, it means they had a benchmark with a certain amount of stock allocated. It means they're changing their allocation by small percentages usually, giving more to large cap. And in the end, this is what they mean by overweight. So I was confused early on in my career. I hear people say, I'm overweight, large cap stocks. And I thought that meant does that mean they're buying only large cap stocks? No, it means that relative to the benchmark, they think large cap's gonna outperform by a little bit. So they increase the slice from 55% to 60. All right, last thing, I'll go through it quickly here. Death and taxes. Let's face these horrors together, people. Nobody lives forever and most income is taxed. So. There's taxes that you can control, like the state tax. And when you take capital gains, there's one you can't, like income tax and the estate takes estate tax rate when you die. You only get to keep your after-tax returns. So look at this. This is 25 years of investing in the S&P. Uh, you get a 6x return on your money, a 10x return if you reinvest your dividends. And note that they get taxed even if they're reinvested. But the difference in outcome is... Amazing, actually. Again, this is the, the beauty of the compounding in time. But you only get to keep your after-tax returns. And the disappointing thing here is what happened to your 10x? Tax and inflation, but mostly tax happen. Tax eats away at the compounding effect and withdraws. Tax and the withdrawals from the money you're putting in act in the opposite manner of consistent additions to your savings. They're magnified and they're often missed. So you can see here, there's a huge difference. You thought you're getting 10X, you end up with something like 5X when you factor in taxes, folks. So tax and the impact on your investment is often called tax drag. So you can look at these differences in outcomes. It's, uh, it can be staggering. Jason is a great uh, tax guy, a resource for questions on that. Tax loss harvesting is one thing you can do to affect some of this. It's selling a losing position to offset a gain. Uh, but now I want to talk about, now that we set that groundwork, I want to talk about a few more things real quick. Early in your career, the best thing you can do to avoid the tax problems here is put money into tax deferred accounts. Uh, say yes to your ESPP plan, set up a Roth IRA. In fact, any parents out here, I want to give you one piece of advice. When your kids, starting around age 18, I think they have to be 18, when your kids earn money, the best thing you can do for your kids is to tell them for every dollar you earn up to, I think 5,000, which is the most you can put in. I will put that amount of money in an IRA account for you. Now, are you giving your kid money? Yes, you are, but you're giving them money that goes into their savings. That money will compound, compound over their lifetime, probably 20 X if it's invested reasonably. And I'm really a big fan of doing that. I did it for my kids and it, it's, it's been great way to get them introduced to investing. Um, I want to talk about mortgage real quick. 
Mortgage is the most leveraged investment you can legally make. Uh, when you put 20% down, you're getting a 5x leverage, whether you know it or not. And the 10% down is giving you a 10x leverage, which you can't do anywhere else legally that I'm aware of. Now, purchasing a home is important. It's uh, probably one of the most important financial decisions you can make. It's not a good thing if you want to work in London or you want to hop jobs or you're not sure where you want to live or um, you're going to move from city to city because you lose about 6% for going in and out of the transactions. However, I want to make this clear. In the Bay Area, 8% has been a reasonable growth rate in real estate. Uh, and if you look at the levered return on real estate and investing, let's just do the math here. The, this formula, basically, you're going to get 8% on your, your investment unlevered. You have a 5x return on the difference between the, the amount you are receiving, the unlevered return, and the borrowing cost here. You end up with a 28% 28% return, uh, basically a, a levered return on this. And if you hold your real estate for a long time, you get long-term capital gains on this. The interest is deductible. That's not factored in. And you're repaying your mortgage with inflated, inflation eroded dollars. So I think you know, people talk about home ownership building wealth. It's actually this multiplying effect that you get from a mortgage that builds wealth. You won't get those returns if you pay cash for a house, folks. It's the mortgage that's doing this in a, in a lot of cases. Here's a Bay Area real estate. You can, you can look at the value here. There's periods of growth that are 100%. Uh, look at this. And then there's been you know periods of, of uh, downturns. But over any long time span here in the Bay Area, you're likely to make more money on your real estate than you will in your startup, unless you hit a home run. So something to think about. Final thoughts, it's the cheapest loan you can get. You lock it in for 30 years fixed, especially today when the rates are so low. And if you haven't refinanced and you can gain more than about, I would say half a percentage point, it could be worth it for you. Don't rush to pay off your house. It's good debt to have. It also gives you the ability to have a, a home equity line of credit, which gives you access to greater cash if you need it. And in old age, you can use a reverse mortgage to provide some cash. So believe it or not, I'm a big fan of keeping a mortgage. Um, all right. Marriage, I won't talk about this too much. Just to say, Society's gotten different because people get married when they're older, they get married second and third times. You should think about your finances and particular your estate plan if you're getting married and one or both of you has kids from another marriage. Um, before retirement, I want you to think about this plan, a two-year plan before you give notice when you're retiring. You should buy a home in your retirement state if you're moving. I would avoid a condo or a townhome due to the association fees, unless you like the way it's run and think it's, it's low because those fees will go up with inflation. You should get a 30 year fixed rate mortgage unless the rates are high, should do it while you're employed. This is a great hedge against your bond portfolio. Whoops, sorry about that. And it's a great hedge against inflation. You can track your expenses for a year and work with an advisor to figure out what you'll need in retirement. And you should accelerate your 401k and all retirement contributions. Uh, some other things to keep in mind, if you can negotiate some sort of severance payout and have it span two tax years, that's better. You'll get, you'll pay less taxes. Ask about in part-time work or uh, consulting status. And don't sell stock that you have while you're still earning income because the minute you retire, you'll earn less income, pay less taxes. After retirement, you should adjust your withdrawals from savings with the market gains. Take less out when the market is down. Those cost you more. Take out a little more when the market's up. Betterment does this. It's kind of their single biggest benefit, I think. Um, mathematically, it does improve things, but you can do it yourself. You don't, and you can work with an advisor to do that. Get a part-time job or some additional income, track your budget. Pensions, uh, most of our parents received pensions. Social Security is not really a pension, folks. It's small by a lot of uh, living cost standards. 3,800, I think is the max if you wait till you're 70. If you live in the Bay Area, you're going to need about 10000 a month, I think, to live. And that's a pretty high tax bracket, which brings me to another thing. Uh, we'll talk about um, 
tax and deferral. And I know we're going over, but there's only a few more slides left if you want to stick to this. I want to talk a little bit about wealth building in Silicon Valley. Concentrated risk builds your wealth rapidly, and that can make you wealthy. It also destroys your wealth rapidly, and that can make you poor when you thought you were rich. It's best done when you're young, and the tax can be devastating. There's a many stories I've, I've heard over the years of people who bought a stock very cheap, generated a huge tax bill, say $100 a share. That means they owe $30 or $40 a share on all that stock. And then the stock falls to something like $20 a share. And at this point, even if you sold everything you had, you can't pay your tax bill by selling all your stock. And people get in these bad positions. The solution to this, by the way, exercise your stock early. Look at something called an 83B filing. And um, you can start your, your basis out so that then when you sell the stock, you only pay tax on that gain. Diversified risk builds wealth slowly, keeps you wealthy, rarely destroys wealth, keeps you wealthy, uh, and it works throughout your lifetime. So go with the diversified approach, particularly when you're older and when you have uh, less tolerance for risk. Concentrated stock positions are bad in general. I know people say, hey, wait, I'm at Google. I work there. All my wealth is there. Uh, I've got stock there. That's great if it's going in your favor. But if you have a downturn, you could lose your job. The stock could go down, all these things. So it's good to diversify. One of the risks is you have a less efficient portfolio. You can't necessarily sell it all at once. And there's task ri tax risk, which we talked about. Some strategies for dealing with a concentrated position, you can hedge it. An interesting thing here, if you did have, say, $10 million in Google stock, there are tax-free exchanges where you can get together with somebody who has $10 million from Facebook, someone else has $10 million from Microsoft, put it all in a portfolio, you'd pay no tax, and then you get the benefit of the diversification of a portfolio. You have to work with somebody to do this, folks, but uh, it's possible charitable giving. And another thing you can do is you can wait until your death, in which case those stocks will get a step up in basis and pass to your heirs. Um, quick thoughts on new wealth. I'll send this out in an email if you want or put it on the website. But basically, maintain your current lifestyle for six months. Your view of money will change. Uh, pay off all your non-mortgage debt, but don't pay off your mortgage. It's generally not a good thing. You'll earn far more money in the market. Um, Put your funds in an insured account, and I think you should work with an work with uh, an advisor. Set up a trust to avoid probate and increase your insurance. Um, some non-obvious things, yeah. Don't pay off your mortgage. Uh, be careful what you spend your money on, and you should go see a, a couples counselor if you're married because people often have different wealth visions for what they want to do when they make a lot of money, and you should work that stuff out. Missteps and scams. I want to talk about pitfalls along the way. Home mortgages, make sure there's no prepayment penalty so you can refinance. Certain loans, particularly auto loans, have these really onerous terms. Uh, they have no prepayment penalty, yay, but they some of them do this thing, I think it's called 770, where they charge you all the interest payments first. So you can pay it back early, but you don't get the benefit of paying back early. You've essentially paid like of a seven year loan, the first two years are all interest payments. So avoid financing like that, go to a credit union or something like that. Uh, uh, let's see, yeah, okay, we talked about the interest first loans. Think about spending as an investment. Um, trips I took with college people and I remember thinking, oh, that's expensive. I have a lifetime of memories, that was a good investment. May not be true for coffee, donuts, and certain automobiles. Uh, contributions to retirement is just one last thing. I think we're very close to the edge here. Um, 401k. I want you to think carefully about 401k contributions versus Roth IRA contributions. If you're young, the Roth is a great way to go. With a 401k, you put pre-tax dollars in, so you're not paying income tax on that. Transactions in your account are not taxed. This is great for growth. There's no tax drag. But when the money comes out, you're going to be paying income tax rates. Same as your, sorry, same as your W-2. And 
even though you may have held those assets for over a year, you have uh, you are not entitled to uh, capital gain rates. You're going to pay the income rates. Now, if you live in California and you've done well, you're going to be earning about $120,000, which in the eyes of the federal government folks is not poor. So your tax rate can be um, quite high. With a Roth, the after-tax dollars go in. You pay the income tax on the money you deposit, but there's no tax on the transactions. And when you take the money out, there's zero taxes, and which is a, a real home run. And there's no penalty for taking out as much as you want after a certain age. So a great mix to have when you're retired is, a, is some in a traditional IRA and some in a Roth. If you ever have a need for uh, a lot of cash at once, you can take money out of the Roth without a penalty. Roth contributions are limited. It's about, I think it's about $5,500 or so. However, there's this thing called a backdoor contribution. You can take money from your traditional IRA, transfer it to your Roth IRA. It's taxed as income. But if this is a year in which you're not working, folks, I highly recommend looking into changing uh, some of your funds in your traditional IRA to a Roth IRA. I think Jason is going to give a presentation on this later. I don't want to go there. Let's see. Uh, some words about returns. I don't think we need to go this. Let's see. Talk about that. Uh, just a slide here on jargon. So when you go to talk to an advisor, you have a good view of things. You know, people talk about risk on and risk off in the market. These are whether people want to buy growth stocks, take big risks or being conservative. We talked about overweight. Um, I think a lot of this stuff we, we can deal with later. Dollar cost averaging. That's where you buy a fixed amount over time intervals. If you're investing with money that you only earn every month, I think that's a good policy. If you have a lump sum to put in, in general, holding your nose and putting most of it in the market or a split over a couple of payments is better because the market generally goes up, folks. Three out of four years, it's up. And dollar cost averaging, it may just mean you're missing out on, on gains there. Last and second to the last slide here. How do I get to a million dollars by age 67? If you start young, it's not that hard. $415 a month. Uh, if the later you start, the more you have to put in. And if you just want to work hard at saving and earning in 20 years, if you put $2,200 a month away, you'll have a million dollars in 20 years with 6% return. And actually, if you know from the Vanguard thing that I mentioned, that was yielding 12 to 14% over a 10 year period. So you can get, get by with even less. And with that, my life advice, additional MIT curriculum for your personal finance. Therapy, if you have problems with money, I put that in the questionnaire, if you did it, a lot of people have different views from about money that came from their family. If you feel guilty making money, make a promise to yourself, share it with friends that you'll give 10% to your favorite charity and get investing. Learn Microsoft Excel, work on certain business success, bid to win and other things. If nobody values you, if you're not treated as a valuable contributor at your job, I think you should leave where you will be valued. And final thoughts, low income this year, convert your IRA to a Roth. If you have capital gains and you have a business with losses, you can sell the stock to offset the gains in the business losses this year. If you have income, save, save, save. If you don't have a financial plan, start working on folks and feel free to reach out and contact me. And that's the end. Now, I think, Jason, we should pause the recording. If anybody has questions, Jason and I will hang around and answer the best we can. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Uh, again, if you have any uh, questions or you'd like to follow up, get a copy of the slides, talk more about the material, you can reach me at the two email addresses below. I would be happy to speak with any of you about specific questions or your situation. And we look forward to feedback and anything we can do in the future that might be of help to you. Thanks again. Thanks for, thanks for showing up, everybody. This event is an MIT Club of Northern California sponsored club event. And we just wanted to let you guys know, uh, 
it's a volunteer led organization and would love to get more people involved and in volunteering it's it's a it's we represent 16 roughly 1000 alumni uh it rounds to 16 now and uh just to put in a for the fin track uh we've got more events coming uh stay tuned give us feedback thanks <laughs>